The copper banded butterfly is an extremely difficult fish to keep and the best advice I can give you is not to buy one. So this video isn't intended to encourage you to do so, but I've taken the view that if you're dead set on getting one, nothing I can say will put you off. And so, as my copper band celebrates his one year anniversary in my tank, Today I'll share 5 tips to give you the best possible chance of success. And if it's your first time here and you want a new reefing video every week, make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss out when I upload. The first thing you'll need to consider is how suitable your tank is. Most literature will recommend at least a 100 gallon tank, which effectively means 4 foot by 2 foot by 2 foot. You will find some places that recommend as little as 55 gallons, i.e. a 3 foot Red Sea Reefer 250, but a smaller tank will decrease your chances of success. In the wild, copper bands use their long beaks to pick food out of crevices in the rockwork, which is how they spend their entire day. So the less space and rockwork you have, the less happy they will be. And that segues into tank age. Personally, I'd avoid young tanks of less than a year old. Some take the view that a bare quarantine style tank is the best place to get a copper band feeding without competition from other fish. But my view is that the copper band will benefit from a more natural environment, which means an established tank with corals, hiding places and an abundance of natural microfauna such as fanworms and aptasia. It's also worth avoiding aggressive tank mates. Copper bands are timid, slow moving fish, so they can't escape bullying easily. As a result, I caught and rehomed my purple tang, who immediately showed signs of aggression when I bought the copper band. Now, I'm not saying you can't keep tanks with copper bands, but an ongoing aggression will reduce your chances of success. And the early stages are critical in helping your copper band settle, and in my experience at least, adding a tank after a copper band is the way to go. Step number two is, in my opinion, the single most important one, and that is choosing the right specimen. Most marine shops will get multiple copper bands in every week, so there's no need to rush for fear of missing out. You'll want to spend a good five minutes examining the fish, look at it really closely and look for any signs that it's not in good health. The most obvious is to look for marks on the fish that don't look natural, such as scuffs or scars, or damage to the beak. And of course, if it has any white spots on it, walk away. White spots are usually some kind of disease, and even something relatively harmless like fluffy white lymphocystis spots are better avoided. The less stressed the fish is, the better. But most importantly, you want to make sure it's not too thin. If you don't know what to look for, that is a sure sign in itself that you're not ready to buy a copper band. And it will do you good if you see dozens of specimens over several months so you get used to noticing smaller details. The last copper band I bought before my current one is a great example. At first he looks fine, but if you look closer, you'll see a sunken belly with no real meat on him. Being laterally compressed, copper bands are thin looking fish at the best of times, but if they have no weight on them, they probably haven't eaten much at all for weeks, so they are almost certain to die. The fish should also be settled in the shop, swimming around the rock looking for food, and not cowering still in a corner. And once you've ticked all of those boxes, which is likely to be at least a few months into your search, you should ask to see it feeding. If it tentatively pecks at one or two bits of food after carefully inspecting them, walk away. In your tank there will be fierce competition and food will go quickly, so a tentative eater won't stand a chance. You want to see it going crazy for food and eating as much as it possibly can until there's none left. Anything less is a hard pass. And it's worth pointing out that an enthusiastic eater is a minimum requirement, not an indication of success. Copper bands are notorious for going on hunger strike when they change tanks. This guy for example was feeding like a crazed wolverine in the shop and yet he died a few weeks after I bought him. Once you've ticked all of those boxes, you're ready to take him home, which is where the hard work begins. Weaning them onto a captive diet is very hit and miss indeed, so to increase your chances of success, you'll want to throw the kitchen sink at it and try a wide variety of food. Food that has worked well anecdotally includes live bloodworm, clams on the half shell, mysis shrimp, mastic and garlic infused mysis shrimp. If you do use mastic, try to wedge it into your rocks to replicate the copper band's natural feeding behaviour. You can also create a feeding device that only the copper band's beak can get into. The most common method is to drill holes into a piece of PVC pipe and attach it to a magnetic glass cleaner. I used a sample cup to do a similar job, although my copper band would wait for the food to float out rather than stick his beak in. 
I fed as much as a dozen cubes of frozen food a day to maximize my chances of success. And while it worked, it pushed my nitrate and phosphate levels up really high, so be prepared to deal with the consequences of overfeeding. Now I mentioned earlier that natural fauna like Aptasia anemones and fan worms will help, but again that is hit and miss, and many copper bands will starve to death rather than eat them, or eat them then starve to death after. So as with all of these tips, it is by no means a guarantee, and each one will simply decrease your chances of failure. Next we come to ongoing care. After a couple of months, I reduce feeding to a sensible level, and I now feed 4 cubes of frozen mice's shrimp every day. However, I've tried four or five varieties of pellet food with no joy, so I can only feed my tank frozen food. And while my copper band is healthy, he's certainly not fat, so I see my feeding level as a minimum. And I occasionally feed live bloodworm, which he gobbles up quite happily, as do my other fish. Now mine did eventually clear out my Aptasia anemones, and if you have rocks in your sump with Aptasia on them, it's a good idea to put them in your tank and let the copper band eat the Aptasia, then return the rock to your sump for more apps to grow, and repeat the process. And because mine only eats frozen, I have to get someone in to feed him when I go away on holiday, so I still find him restrictive in the long term. Although aside from that, I found him relatively easy going day to day, and the tricky part was choosing the right one, then getting him to eat in the first place. And my final tip is to buy something else. If you do not play the game, you cannot lose. And I really mean that. I bought three copper bands before this one, all of whom died despite me ticking many or all of the boxes I've talked about in this video. For every healthy copper band you see online, there will be 10 dead ones, and I can tell you from personal experience it feels pretty bad when you're responsible for the death of such a beautiful fish. So think long and hard about getting a copper band, and give real consideration to the brilliant alternatives like the pyramid butterfly or yellow longnose, both of whom are much easier to keep and only marginally less pretty. If you enjoyed the video then give it a thumbs up and subscribe for next week, and until next time, happy reefing.